Hello, and welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast, where it is my job to discuss and analyze democratic institutions. The two-round presidential elections in France back in April created lots of discussions in the media and widespread concerns that right-wing candidate Marine Le Pen would rise to power. Yet Emmanuel Macron prevailed in the second round with 58% of the vote. Very soon, on June 12th and 19th, voters in France are going to the polls to elect 577 members of the National Assembly. With Emiliano Grossman, I discuss the electoral systems used in the French democracy, both for the presidential and legislative elections. We dive into the historical roots of the Fifth Republic that introduced many of these institutions in 1958 and how they evolved over time. Emiliano explains how they affect representation, the political party landscape and party strategies to win votes. It was an instructive and insightful conversation in which Emiliano shares his opinions based on 20 years of political research. Emiliano Grossman is an associate professor at the Centre d'études européennes et de politique comparée at Sciences Po in Paris since 2012. He got his PhD from Sciences Po and completed his habilitation from Sciences Po Grenoble in 2014. He has published numerous articles in top academic journals on comparative political institutions and agenda-setting processes. His latest book is titled Do Elections Still Matter? Mandates, Institutions and Policies in Western Europe. I'll link to his Twitter account and his website in the show notes. I am your host, Stefan Kibwatz, and this is the 24th episode of the Rules of the Game podcast. I am a political economist with a PhD in economics from the University of Bern in Switzerland, and I previously held positions at the London School of Economics and Political Science and the Center for Global Development. You find a full transcript of this episode on my website, rulesofthegame.blog. I am always curious to hear your opinion, so just send me an email to stefan.kyberts at gmail.com. And please leave a review and share this episode with friends and colleagues. Now please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Emiliano Rosman. Emiliano Grossman, welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast. I'm very happy to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. So my first question, as always, is what is your first memory of democracy? I thought about that. I was actually born in Argentina and I grew up in Germany. So I, I assume that my first memory of democracy is the contrast to autocracy. So my parents were exiles from the Argentine dictatorship in the 1970s. So And I remember being afraid of Argentina, like in my three or four year old mind, like of uh, uh, being scared of what could happen to us in a non-democratic country. So it was more the contrast between a democratic and a non-democratic country that I remember still very vividly. Okay, that's that's very interesting. And also, I realized that many of my guests actually on the podcast have some memory of a time when there was not not democracy yet, or it was like a time of political uprising or dictatorship as well. So today I, I'd like to talk about the French electoral institutions. Obviously now the, there was the, the French presidential election and then we have the, the legislative elections in, in June coming up. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's a good time to talk about these uh, electoral systems and how they affect uh, French politics. So the French presidential elections have, have uh, created qu quite a lot of discussion in, in 2017, but also now, probably also because, um, you know, Marine Le Pen um, was like uh, quite a strong contender and a lot of people were afraid that uh, quite a, a right wing, a radical right wing person would become very powerful in France. So can you tell 
a bit about the French presidential election system and maybe what are what are its characteristics and also what is your your opinion of it? Okay, maybe uh, some historical detail on this. So the uh, the Fifth Republic basically responds to to the, uh, an institutional crisis uh, that comes along with the the Algerian civil war, Algerian war, basically, which is a decolonization war, in um, which starts in 1956 and is, is more or less result in 58. So in 58, in the situation of almost uh, civil war in France, in metropolitan France, the, the assembly calls back General de Gaulle, who had been had, had retired from politics, and gives him more or less in a in a step of of well of probably inconstitutional behavior, right? So there gives him uh, plenary powers to redraw a new constitution. So there, there had been a conflict on that back in 1946 where uh, he had already exposed his ideas of a more presidential system and uh, had lost. Like there had been a referendum on that and, and his, his project had been rejected by a majority. So here in this situation of crisis, he comes back, he creates a, a, an entirely different constitution which gives a much more central place to the president. And, and he has more or less a blank check, basically, to write that constitution. As a matter of fact, in the original version of the, of the constitution adopted in October of 1958, there is no direct election of the president, right? So that's, that will actually be introduced in another problematic step from a constitutional point of view, like uh, through a referendum that is in principle not designed to change the constitution in 1962, he will introduce the direct election of the president that will take place for the first time in 1965. So the, the electoral system is very peculiar. Uh, well, it's this two-round system that now exists in a couple of countries, but France has always been, uh, has been special because basically it provides you with the idea that you can pick your favorite candidate in the first round, and uh, and then you settle for one of the two candidates that arrive first in the second round, right? So that's so basically with the idea that there's two different logics. There's been a couple of works on that, especially on developing countries, discouraging those countries from using that because this creates a, a strong uncertainty between the first and the second round and the possibility for uh, uh, possible losers to to disconnect or to uh, make some kind of dissidence from from the electoral system right so so france is not today not a uh, not a, a fragile democracy but it's true that for young democracies this has been an issue i don't remember there's a, a paper on this by cindy sketch which i think is is uh, pretty good on that point but basically the, so the whole system now j just a couple of words on on what the system actually does so the the system basically forces you to very different behavior in the first round and the second round. And that's, I think, is very problematic. In the first round, you basically have to win over your camp, right? So there, so the, uh, so, so basically this, this tends to increase more radical statements or, or more provocative statements. One, the second round, you have to reunite people, right? So there, because you were, you have to win people over from other parties. And this creates some kind of schizophrenia, which I think is very, very problematic. And another, a second effect of this, which I think is very problematic, is that the uh, in order to win this election, you have to present yourself as a as somebody who's who's gonna save the country. Like you have to you have to be some kind of providential figure, right? So there and that's very much also I think there's more this is not just an institutional feature, it's also some of the legacy of, of General de Gaulle, who was this kind of providential figure. He he saved France several times from from civil war and, and dictatorship and and so on and so forth. But the 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 problem is that this creates a lot of expectations on behalf of the candidates. So the candidates tend to exaggerate what they can actually do. But you have to do that because otherwise you will lose against the other candidates who are also exaggerating. Now the problem with this system is that once you are in power, you're back in the real world. And in the real world, there is interdependence, there is other, there is veto points, there is other things going on, and that creates a huge amount of frustration and 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 deception. And that's basically one of the permanent figures of, of uh, French political institutions in general, which I think are mostly created by this electoral system, which is basically you have trusted so much this newly elected president that once he's in power and you realize that he's just a a mortal figure, you you get very very disappointed, and you see that in popularity curves in France, they uh, they usually get very very high at the beginning of the of the mandate, and within a matter of six months, most of this positive capital disappears, 
and actually continues degrading till uh, till the next election, right? So we wrote a book on that in 2017 with my, my colleague Nicolas Sorge, which is called Why We Hate Our Politicians So Much, a reference to Colin Hayes' book on, on, on the UK. And it's true that we, we find this, there is a permanent figure. So we hope that Macron would kind of stop this because he was a, he was a little special be, with, re, uh, with regards to the French history to the extent that he doesn't belong to the classical left and right camps. But in the end, his uh, popularity curves look very much like those of everybody else. And uh, so we'll see, we'll see what happens now. I, I think we'll, we'll talk about the legislative elections in a minute. Cool. Thanks for, for sharing your thoughts on that. So the, the politicians really need to make strong statements, right, in the first round, especially to stand out against the others and then kind of reunite in the in the second round. But when you compare that system, it seems to me, in Switzerland, for example, we also use actually that two-round majoritarian election system in some for some offices, obviously not for such an important office. So do you think, like, compared to the American, like, plurality system, what's your opinion on, on these two systems then? Well, the, the thing is, I think the U.S. Has, has another, has a similar functioning, as a matter of fact, due to the primaries, right? So there are, uh, the primaries, I would compare them to our first round, like where where candidates usually have to convince the radical fringes of your electorate and and therefore especially in the Republican party that's that's always been very very impressive where you where you try to appeal to the far right in the first round and then you do something much more moderate than the second round letting apart for the time being Donald Trump but it's true that in the end they these two systems have a similar functioning the problem is that in our case we we try to introduce like France tried to introduce primaries in the past few years and this has created an additional amount of of, of uncertainty actually in the system right so basically pushing candidates to be ever more provocative, ever more ambitious in their public statements, right? So that, that's very peculiar. Now, one word about the 2022 election, though, which is worth mentioning, because in principle, what we would have historically, like the first time that a far-right candidate made to the second round was in 2002. And one of the reasons that was advanced by many observers at the time was that there was too much fragmentation of the vote in the first round, right? So that basically everybody could vote for anyone who wanted. And, and even though we had a very popular incumbent prime minister, the socialist uh, Lionel Jospin, he actually came in third for a couple of thousand votes behind Jean-Marie Le Pen, because there were three or four different left-wing candidates that split the vote across the, the left-wing electorate. The left didn't have, even though the left was probably majoritarian at the time, they didn't have anyone in the second round. So that was one of the consequences. Now, 2022 was very different. So 20 years apart, actually what happened, like we had a similar, I think we had the same number of candidates than back in, in 2002, 12 candidates. But what happened in the past few weeks, in the last few weeks before the first round, was that actually people already in the first round turned towards more strategic vote, right? So they're rather than picking their favorite candidate, what they did was basically seeing like towards the end of the electoral process, it was clear that the, like we have three polls in France now. We have a centrist poll, the far right poll and the and the left wing poll. And it's true that within each of those polls, people would move towards the most promising candidate. Each of them increased their share by four or five percent over the last two weeks or something, which was which was really impressive and unheard of. And I think that so there may we may be actually witnessing a change of logic in the very functioning of, of this two round system due to cultural or political evolution. So to make sure that one of the candidates either from the left or the right or the center makes it to the to the second round, right? Yeah, absolutely. So what I think is interesting also compared to the American system, for example, you know, France seems to have a, a lot of changes in political parties, right? There is new movements coming up, like the movement from Emmanuel Macron that he founded only in 2016. And then there is others. That's actually interesting that there is still, I mean, I'm used to say that, you know, majoritarian systems, they prefer like the old bigger parties or they, they conserve power. But in France, this doesn't really seem to be the case, right? So honestly, generally speaking, I would say my general answer, I, I don't have a good explanation for, for your question, but, but generally speaking, I, I observe that, that there is greater volatility everywhere. Right, so there. So France is not not an exception. I remember. I remember back in in the early two thousands when we would speak about the fact that 
Eastern European party systems are volatile and that Western European party systems are consolidated, I think nobody would say that again anymore, right? So even even in countries like, take the UK, for instance, where, where your assumption still kind of works because we have two historical parties that still dominate the show, Labour and, and the Conservatives, but that would probably be a very short version of what actually happened over the past 20 years, right? So they're with UKIP, with uh, Nigel Farage, and so on and so forth, which basically created real danger and volatility in the political system and a lot of tensions and polarization. So so even the most, sta- apparently the most stable systems are subject to very, very high levels of volatility. Look at look at Germany, which is, which is not exactly a majoritarian system, but with long considered as a very stable system where you have increasing fragmentation, right? So with with an increasing number of parties, more and more difficult government negotiations. And this basically, I think, applies for for most countries. So I I wouldn't put France very much apart. Where where France is different, I agree with you, is that France has, has this turnover in party organizations, right? So the the right, basically, the, the conservatives create a new party every 10 years, more or less, right? So there, so we had long had the RPR created by Chirac in the 1970s that was replaced by UMP in the early 2000s and and by the Republicain in, at the end of the 2010s, right? So there, so th- this is, it's not exactly always the same circumference, right? So it doesn't cover exactly the same political figures or movements and so on and so forth. On the left, this used to be more stable, but it's true that here we're clearly witnessing a, a wholesale change, right? So there, and, w- and we still don't know where it's headed, right? So there, there is a lot of uncertainty because this new popular union of ecological and social popular movement, the way they call the the, the, the left wing alliance. I'm not entirely sure that's gonna that's ever gonna be a party. Maybe that's there's just an electoral alliance and then they will reorganize as parties once they're after the election. But what is true is that the Socialist Party has all but disappeared and uh, and this election will probably just confirm that. And that's one of the big figures of, of the last fifty years of, of French politics. And it's been replaced by by a left wing movement. I, I I would refrain from calling it a far left movement, to be honest, La France Insoumise, simply because when you look at the nineteen eighties programs from the Socialist Party, they're very much very similar to what what Mélenchon is saying today. It is true that we've moved more towards pro market positions everywhere, but his part his program doesn't even mention much nationalizations or stuff that were very very popular back in the 1980s in the socialist program. And then you have the Greens. You, you still have a tiny share of, of communists and a tiny share of socialists, right? So the the real tension I think will be between the Greens and and the social part, like the the environmental and the social part in the program, and that's that's clearly something that is very challenging, and will, um, and much will depend on how different leaders will situate themselves within the next assembly and within the the political dynamics as as they will start unfolding after June. That's also probably from the European perspective, right? This party fragmentation, this has kind of happened in in all different countries. And it's probably also a, a reflection of, you know, more pronounced interest, you know, or also the kind of broadening of, of political interests, kind of polarization, but still also more dynamics, again, in political parties that I think we see uh, across Europe. So another aspect that is important to mention is obviously the semi-presidential nature of government in France. And this will also then lead us to the legislative uh, elections. Maybe can you say something about the specifics of the semi-presidential system? What's the role of, of the of the prime minister? And how does that link to the legislature? The semi-presidential system, like in Prince, I, my, my late friend, uh, Robert Elgie, who used to be a professor at, at Dublin College University, used to say that actually the one thing that determines, like the only way of actually determining objectively what a semi-presidential system is, is that you have a, a separately elected president and a prime minister, right? So there, so that's basically the baseline definition. But starting from that, you have very, very different semi-presidential systems. Out of the 27 current EU members, actually 12 have semi-presidential systems. The problem is that nobody has ever heard about the Portuguese or the Finnish or the Slovak presidents, right? So they're, they there are directly elected presidents, but they usually are figurehead presidents, which play a, a, a rather secondary role. France, from that point of view, is is different, and and um, there's only 
few other countries that have undergone in among the European countries that have undergone similar experiences. There was Poland for a period before 1999, and and Romania had a period where where the president was more proactive. So in France, what that means is that basically you have two entirely different elections, right? So there, are, and for a long time they were entirely different elections. We'll co- I'll come back to that in a minute. But the, but so with with rather different dynamics but with a certain preeminence for, for the president, right? So what that actually means is when you have, like in 2017, the two elections coming one after the other, so the fir- first the presidential election, then under those circumstances, the legislative election usually will work as some kind of third round of the presidential election. So basically just confirming the presidential election. That did not used to be the case. Before 2002, the terms were different, right? So you had a seven-year presidential term and a five-year legislative term. So, and that would necessarily create some dephasing, right? So there, because you would have at some point legislative elections in the middle of the presidential term. And those elections were usually very, very dangerous for the president. And on three occasions, this created our own national brand of, of divided government, which we call cohabitation. So the last one was in 1997. That was very interesting because Jacques Chirac had been elected in 1995. He had a very large legislative majority that was had been elected in 1993, but he called for new elections one year ahead of the end of the term because he has that power in uh, 1997 because there were a couple of European negotiations going on. And as a consequence, they, uh, in, in particular, the, the, what was called the Nice Treaty. Well, as a consequence of that, they called for those early actions, which he eventually lost, being confronted for five of the seven years of his mandate with a hostile prime minister. So what happens under this situation is really that the prime minister, the president becomes more like a secondary figure, like he can be in Portugal, Slovakia or Finland. And the prime minister becomes the effective chief executive, right? So there, the president still has a couple of powers under those circumstances, especially with regard to the army and, and defense and foreign policy. Because on defense, very simply, he's the one who holds nuclear power, right? So that's, a, that's not a minor thing. And the constitution mentions a couple of things with regard to, to foreign policy and his power to also approve international treaties and so on and so forth. But this very much depends on the effective relationship between the two. So the two presidents that lived through this were François Mitterrand twice and uh, Jacques Chirac once. And it's true that both times there were quite a bit of tensions, but de facto the president basically stops being involved in everyday politics when that happens, right? So the reform of 2002 that came into force in 2002 was supposed to put an end to this, right? So by, by creating two identical terms and those, t- those two five-year terms. So And now the presidential election takes place a couple of weeks, six weeks before the second round takes place, six weeks before the first round of the legislative election with the hope that we would never have again this divided government because divided government has very bad reputation for reasons that I never quite understood because I don't think it's such a bad thing. But in France, it had like a little bit like in the US actually too, divided government is always supposed to create a lot of problems and stalemate and so on and so forth, which is not really true. The, the empirical literature does not show that this that this is what happens. But definitely the idea was that people would not change their mind within six weeks, right? So, and that, and that from now on, we would have united government more or less forever. So that's where this year's election becomes really interesting because things are are not as clear cut this time as they as they were in the three or four past elections. Okay, and there hasn't been so many cases yet, right? Since the reform in that way, but would you say so far the reform did what it was supposed to do? That is kind of unify government in a, in a way. It did, it did. But at the same time, I think I was never a big fan of that, to be honest. So from purely institutional point of view, because it creates a president who's not directly responsible to parliament, who's the effective head of government, uh, of government right? So, there, well, so the prime minister can be voted out of office, but the president is kind of removed from parliament. So it is the prime minister who defends the president's policies in parliament, but there is no way to talk to the president directly. So I find that it's, it creates a kind of much stronger system than the the American presidential system because it creates a presidentialist presidential system that I think is from a democratic point of view somewhat problematic because there is no 
clear accountability. You have to wait for the next presidential election to actually criticize the government because the prime minister is actually some kind of secretary of the president and that's it, right? So, and this is very visible, for instance, in the, the second prime minister that Macron choose, Jean Castex, is just a higher civil servant with no political history. Like, so he has no political capital of his own. So he has reached really a puppet in the hands of the president. At least Edouard Philippe, who was a figure of, of the Conservative Party, had some legitimacy of his own. He's the mayor of Le Havre, which is one, one of the bigger cities on, on the West Coast. So there clearly is the temptation of the president to actually pick some kind of figurehead prime minister, right? So we're turning this entirely around with what I was saying earlier for Portugal or Finland, where you have a figurehead president. So here we have a figurehead prime minister with a president actually governing without being effectively accountable to, to parliament. Right. And the prime minister is more an agent of the president rather than of parliament. But still, the president, when he or she picks the prime minister, needs to really take into account the majorities in parliament, yes. right? Yes. But here we, here we come to the legislative elections, actually. So the, uh, so the legislative elections have a system similar to the one in uh, used for the presidential election. But there are some tiny but very important differences. So the thing is that For the legislative and electoral system, there is no limit of number of candidates who make it into the second round. So there's 577 districts. It's a two-round majoritarian system. And those who qualify for the, for the second round are those candidates who get more than 12.5% of the registered voters. Now, this is a very big figure when you think about it, especially when turnout is low. Like, let's say when turnout is 50%, that means that you need 25% of the vote, which, which is huge, right? So there. So why is this important? Because basically what happens, provided that you have the presidential election first and that the presidential election basically concentrates all the political attention, there is a usually what happens in those six weeks between the, the second round and the first round of the leg legislative election is that the the winners stay mobilized while the losers demobilize. So usually what you have is a much lower turnout at the legislative elections under those circumstances than uh, for the presidential election. So this year, the presidential election turnout wasn't amazing. It was one of the lowest, but it's still around 70%, right? So there, in, uh, in 2017, there was a 20% drop in turnout between the presidential election and the parliamentary election. For the first time in history, in recorded uh, history, there was a turnout of uh, less than 50% for the legislative elections. So what that does is that basically it creates a huge premium for the winner because the demobilization is much weaker for the winner than it is for everyone else. So I basically twittered a little bit about this in, in, in the past few weeks. And I had a response from one candidate of the La France Insoumise Mélenchon's party who, who told me that he lost 66% between the first round of the presidential election and the first round of the legislative election of the vote, because basically he was a candidate in Dijon. So he lost 66% of, of the number of votes, right? So And so didn't make it into the second round as a consequence. And that this is a, this is a real issue. I think that creates a huge bonus for the president, because what happened in 2017 is that Emmanuel Macron, with a new party and mostly unknown candidates, obtained a, a very large absolute majority of seats, right? So there so more than 400 seats out of 577. So he was free to govern as he pleased, provided that most of his candidates were not real professional politicians. There was very little resistance. And as a consequence, he He governed as if parliament didn't exist, right? So even though you're right that in principle it's parliament that, that determines the majority, in 2017, Emmanuel Macron was able to do as if his presidential majority was enough to govern, which I agree was a little exceptional. So this is not how it usually happens. So essentially the president, he was almost able to save the, the results from, from the presidential elections over to the legislative uh, elections. But it was still not possible for older parties, for the, the more um, traditional parties to defend really these seats. That's also still quite, quite surprising, right? It's always been a little bit surprising to me. It's also, it's, I think that's much more a cultural than a political issue. So what happens is that once you lose the presidential election, the losers also demobilize, not just their electorates. Right. So they, they do much less campaigning and much less uh, mobilization, much less meetings and so on and so forth than the winners. 
And that's that's an interesting thing because I there is no reason to do that, right? So you could perfectly well say, like in 2017, Macron won against Marine Le Pen. The left could have said, well, now let's campaign to win the legislative elections, but nobody did that. And de facto, Jean, Jean-Luc Mélenchon back in 2017 was a little bit bitter about his defeat because he had done a good campaign, exceptionally good campaign for like, you know, nobody expected him to be that high. And then he kind of disappeared and his party hardly campaigned and, and the same actually for Marine Le Pen. So they're, they actually both got very, very weak results in the, in the subsequent legislative election. So this is where difference takes place this year with regard to 2017. Jean-Luc Mélenchon provided that this year the election was much more open than it was in 2017. He immediately came out of the woods saying, elect me prime minister, right? So which is, which is a kind of a abusive terms because the prime minister is not a direct election. But it's it was a way definitely to make that election more interesting. And we know that participation is usually higher when there is a bigger stake. And very clearly, he has managed to convince people that there is a stake this time and that Macron's victory at the legislative elections should not be taken for granted. So there is clearly some mobilization going on. And it's true that for the time being, the only thing we talk about in the political debate mm-hmm is the left-wing alliance, which is really interesting because they came in third in the presidential election, and yet it is them who are buzzing currently in the media, right? So that's that's very interesting. So 2017, it was almost like all the losing parties were completely disappointed and, and almost disappeared. So it was like a freeway for, for Macron. And this was probably a mistake from their perspective, right? Because they also lost power in, in that in that game, right? And now they're almost trying to force themselves into cohabitation, maybe, or to really to have a step in the door, right? Well, that's exactly what they're hoping for. It's still unlikely, but it's true that there is no, provided that they manage to to unite the four main left wing parties: the Communists, the Greens, France Insoumise, and and the Socialists they definitely have a strong possibility to reach this 12.5% mark in the first round in a very large number of constituencies. So I calculated that for fun. And basically, they could be present in the second round of more than 420 constituencies, which would put them in a very interesting position, provided that we have three polls. Much will depend on what Macronists will do in those constituencies where Le Pen's party comes first. And provided that many of the members of Macron's parties are former socialists, there could be some additional vote reserves for the left-wing coalition. So I think it looks really interesting, right? So what I'm definitely convinced of at this stage, I'm not convinced that they can win it, right? So they can create or force a new cohabitation. But what I'm pretty convinced is that they will be the second most important force in parliament, provided that Marine Le Pen on her side has not managed to create a union of the far right, because there were two far right forces in the presidential election. But they appeal to rather different electorates, and they've been very hostile to each other. So I assume that the Rassemblement National, Marine Le Pen's party, will not do much better than in 2017. So as a consequence, I expect the left wing alliance to be the main opposition to Macron, if not more. So I'm, I'm not excluding the possibility of new divided government. It's just very unlikely. That's very interesting. Also, it will force Macron to consider more of a compromise, I guess, with the different forces. Yeah. Well, that's his big challenge right now, right? So I think what he understood very clearly is that Ma- Macron did a very strange campaign, right? So he hardly campaigned, really. I think as the president who had mastered the yellow vests, the pandemic, and who had been playing a major role in the Ukraine crisis, I assume that he probably hoped that this would be enough to win re-election, right? So he realized like two weeks before the first round that this might not be enough, right? So that, that the others were closing in and that there was a lot of opposition coming in. And so he started in the, at the very end of the campaign, started doing some campaigning. But in the end, he was a little nonchalant. To, to use a French word. So the and it's true that right now he's paying the price for that because he never quite developed his party. So the party has not no real identity. It's not very clear who those people are. It didn't grow together as a political movement. It's not very clear what Macron's 
convictions are on many central issues. So we, what we know from Macron is that he's a pro-market and pro-liberalization candidate and that he very, feels very strongly about that. But we also know that he's very flexible on some of the other issues, right? So, and I think there's at least three issues which have become very, very important in, the, in this election and where we, he will have to take clear stances in the weeks to come. The first is the institutional issue. So there is a lot of discussion going on on the on this electoral system that we've been talking about and every single in the legislative at the legislative the legislative, yeah, yeah, yeah. and every single candidate i think this time was favoring every one of the 12 candidates i think was favoring a reform maybe not the conservatives but everyone else was favoring a more proportional electoral system macron already back in 2017 had promised to enact at least some share of proportional vote in, and, and to change the electoral system in that direction. So he, his excuse is that he couldn't do it given the pandemic, given all the things that happened. And maybe that's true. I'm not disputing that. But what is very clear is that the three main candidates have a proportional electoral system very high on, on their priority list. So Marine Le Pen and Jean-Luc Mélenchon. And so there is an, an, apparently a consensus in favor of that. The problem is that this has been promised by every single president since the 1980s and never been implemented once they were in power because the, that's the problem with this, this Fifth Republic is that they, uh, everybody agrees that this presidential function is much too powerful. But once you have it, And you are the one who, who has that power. Why would you give it away, right? So there, yeah, yeah, there is a the typical pattern. <laughs> the typical pattern, right? So there, and that's clearly an issue here. I think this time things look a little bit better because first Macron knows that he has limited legitimacy, right? So he only bat Marine Le Pen by less than 20%, percent, right? So which is which is not an impressive result against the far right candidate uh, in the second round. He knows that he's not standing for re-election. And his party did not really take roots, right? So for I, I'm, we're not entirely sure what will remain of this after the end of this mandate, right? So for, for that, from that point of view, I think that the conditions, the context is probably favorable to uh, a reform of the electoral system. The, the two other issues that, that people are waiting for him, for uh, the, one is the environment, like so something that he's been very vocal about, but not very active, <laughs> right? So there, so that's uh, that's something, and he has announced that he will name a prime minister who will be in charge of uh, environmental planification, whatever that means. And it's true that the left-wing alliance has put that very high up in their priority list. So that, And that's clearly something where especially young voters uh, are very, very demanding. And it's true that young voters who had massively voted for Macron in 2017 massively deserted Macron this time, right? So Macron only made it to the second round thanks to the vote of people of, of 65 and above. Right. So there. So that's that's very that's very interesting. And the third issue, I think, which is the one that Macron is least at ease about is issues of inequality and, and social justice. Right. So which is also something where younger voters feel very strongly about, but not just younger voters. It's only also people. There's also this yellow vest dimension on this, which is very, very much of a rural urban divide. Uh, so Marine Le Pen is the rural president, like she won in most rural areas. Jean-Luc Mélenchon did very good in the cities, and Macron did a little bit okay in both, and overall better than the two others. But it's true that this dimension is very, very important. And and that's those are, the, I think, the three issues. The electoral reform, environment, and social justice are the three issues on which Macron has to say something if he wants to be credible at the legislative elections in June. That's super interesting. And also, I will look forward to finding these topics in his addresses. One thing is that in 1985, there was already a reform for proportional representation for the National Assembly. But This didn't hold, so it was removed or reversed right after the 1986 election. So the coalition for reform was really not that stable, right? Absolutely. Why, why was that? Well, what happened basically is that it gave a big share to the Front National, to the far-right party. And it's true that the conservatives were always in favor of the classical two-round system. And they probably still are. Because like, it so, preserved power for a long time, right? Yeah, exactly. So... I think nowadays we're moving away from this. First, the Conservative Party, which is probably still the main defender of the system, 
is weakened, right? So the, the conservative candidate, Valérie Pécresse, made less than 5% in the first round of the presidential election. So the party is also financially weakened because like, there is a rule according to which your campaign expenses are not reimbursed if you get less than 5%. So she actually paid a lot of her money out of her own pocket and now has a 5 or 6 million euro debt personal debt. So she's calling for more donations to to make up for that. But that here there, there is clearly this is the main force against it. And I think they're today not important enough to actually prevent that. So back in two, 1986, they won and they had promised from the very start that they would revert that reform immediately after coming to power. And then nobody touched that ever again. Right. So that's clearly what happened back then. I think the situation today is very different. I think there is a large share of of the French electorate that consider that it's not normal that the second party in France, the, the Rassemblement National, only has three MPs. So how could can it, how can you possibly have three MPs with twenty percent of the vote? So that's clear, that's clearly something which I think is is politically less acceptable today. And if we have to do with the greater share of, of far-right representatives, then so be it. I think that's what a large share of public opinion thinks, but also a large share of the political personnel considers that it's probably better for those people to be actually visible, commit mistakes, pay the price for those mistakes, and so on and so forth, rather than imagining that you can do away with the problem just by not seeing it. And I think there is some evolution in political discourse on those issues that makes the situation more favorable. And it's true that all the other forces are also more in favor of more proportional government, right? So they're actually, the, I find interestingly, the one party that could have been more opposed to it is uh, Mélenchon's party, because Mélenchon's party has very concentrated territorial presence, right? So they have, they have a couple of strongholds where they do extremely well, right? So mostly the northern suburbs of Paris, some of the Paris neighborhoods, uh, in the northeast of Paris, and then in the overseas departments, and and a couple of other suburbs in, of other big cities like Lyon and, and Toulouse and a couple of other places like that. So it's true that they're not the ones that are most favored by the system, but they have, for probably ideological reasons, have been favoring the proportional electoral system more than anyone else for the past few years. So we'll see what happens. Like, I think there, there is a there is a real opportunity this time. I've, I've never quite believed that this would ever happen. <laughs> this time, I, I'm kind of more optimistic that there might be some change going on. And this could clearly restabilize the party system as well, right? Well, because that's... I feel like the majori two-round majoritarian system also favors movements that rise, but then also they, they ebb, right? So for, for Macron, for example, that hasn't really a strong party institutionalization, right? For him, it was really beneficial, like in 2017, when there was almost another revolution, but this social movement that suddenly was really strong and he, he won a lot of seats. But then once that, that dynamic is gone, then... It's also a loss for, actually, for such movements. Yeah. Actually, we, you can calculate that. It's, it's the most disproportional system there is. It's more disproportional than the UK system, which is terribly disproportional, right? So, and unlike the UK system, in the UK system, it's very simple. Like it's, you basically have some kind of natural threshold, which is around 35%. It changes a little bit from one election to the next. But if you reach more or less 35%, you get a 15% premium and you get 50% of the seats. Like that's more or less it. So for instance, between 2010 and 2015, like the Conservative Party only won 200,000 votes. But that was enough from, for, to shift from a coalition government, the first coalition government in UK history, and an absolute majority of seats going back to the normal situation in the UK. Here, it's completely unforeseeable. Like it's it's really really messy because there are people the the vote is very dispersed in the first round and then much depends on which negotiations will take place between the two rounds and how many triangulars there are and uh, triangulars means when more than two candidates are qualified for the second round so this creates a lot of uncertainty and I agree with you that probably moving to a proportional system would create more predictability and more stability as a matter of fact like that that's an interesting thing France is a country where where you do tons of polling, right? So, and it's true that is something that is criticized a lot, but we hardly ever do polling on legislative elections because they are so unforeseeable. There is no point in making them. So in, in Germany, you have the what they call the, the Sonntagsfrage, the, 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 the Sunday question, which is basically who would you vote for if there were elections on Sunday? And you do that for parliament, obviously, because that's the only election. And, you, and so you have a pretty nice 
idea about where the parties stand over time. In France, we have no idea because we have to wait for the presidential election to know where the parties stand. So the only thing we poll really is the president and not the parliament because the parliament is so unpredictable. So I agree with you that moving to a proportional system would make the whole thing a little bit more predictable. And it would also probably change the logic of the Fifth Republic because fundamentally it would mean that whoever the president is, he will have to build a majority rather than hoping that as presidential bonus will give him that majority, right? So that would clearly be a very fundamental change in the, in the dynamic of the Fifth Republic. And that would probably force the parties also to depolarize political debate. It would probably force the parties to get used to talking to each other more, uh, negotiate with each other more, because historically, uh, Maurice Duverger, who theorized the semi-presidential system, basically considered that this kind of electoral system, so he also wrote on, on electoral systems, the two-round majoritarian electoral system creates a two-camp logic. This is not quite true anymore. What we have is like, because even within those two camps, we have very aggressive behavior on behalf of each candidate, because this presidential election forces you to distinguish you very radically from everyone else. So I think even if we keep the presidential election, which is something that some of the candidates want to change, even if we keep the presidential election, but we introduce the proportional system, this would create some kind of counterweight, right? So maybe having even a feedback effect on the presidential election, because you can't possibly insult your opponents if you have to negotiate coalitions with them in six weeks' time, right? So I think that it will be an interesting experiment. Whatever happens, it will be a very interesting experiment. Yeah, for sure. And also it might raise new questions about the system, right? But in terms of proportional representation, I clearly see that what is concerned right-wing, radical right-wing parties, that there is also more predictability because across Europe, we've seen that their potential to win like large shares of the vote is quite limited, especially once they also gain some power in, in parliament. Well, it means also, it means, however, accepting that, for instance, like in Denmark, they become maybe the, the single most important party in parliament. Right. So there. So it's maybe something that some people still refrain from accepting. But personally, I think this is much more preferable to the situation that we have. So I still have so many questions, but I think we'll leave it at that for the moment. But do you have any books or articles that you could recommend on these topics? Well, I mentioned this paper by Cindy Sketch, which I think is interesting. This is an old paper. I can find you the reference. But basically, on the change of French political institutions, there have been quite a few publications, right? So there, are, the thing is, most of them are not in English. So there, are, I'm afraid that the, most of those criticisms are not clearly available on that. Ge more generally speaking, on the effects of electoral system, I think that I mostly refer to the classics, right? So I'm, I think what we know from electoral systems has been studied by by people like Gary Cox and, and Duverger. And, and I think those classics remain the single most important references. On semi-presidential systems, I still think that the work of Robert Elgy is probably the one I prefer. And there's one paper, it's by uh, Matthew Sugart. And he basically makes this distinction in between what he calls the premier presidentialist semi-presidential system and the parliamentary prime ministerial system, right? So basically pointing to that difference that I make between France, Poland between 93 and 99, and Romania at some point, and all the other semi-presidential systems where the president has a more secondary role. I think the best example of this is probably Ireland, where you have a president who, who's very little autonomous, right? So, And there have been times when there's only been one candidate because there was a partisan uh, consensus on who that candidate should be, but it's clearly the role of that president is comparable to that of the Queen of England, right? So no political position taking ever, even less than what you would find in some parliamentary systems like Italy, where the president still sometimes plays a role, especially in periods of, of political turmoil. But he, uh, France is clearly on the on the premier presidential side of this. And that's, that's what makes it interesting. And I think this paper is probably remains till the present day, the best paper published on this on this specific issue. I'll definitely link to that. And also, of course, I will link to your research, your your website. 
And yeah, we'll probably see still a lot of uh, discussions coming up on, on these, you know, semi-presidential systems. Um, also recently I had uh, Stefan Ganghoff on my podcast yeah, yeah, I know. I know his work uh, well. on semi-parliamentarism, which I thought was um, really an interesting discussion. But I think for now, yeah, we leave it at that. Also, we haven't talked about the, the Senate, the French Senate yet, which also would be, uh, of course, another big discussion. But I think uh, we'll leave that for, for a later moment. And uh, for now... Uh, Emiliano, I thank you very much for taking the time. Thank it you very much. It has been Stefan. super, super interesting. I've I've learned a lot uh, about uh, the French system actually, and um, hopefully we'll have a chance to to chat again. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you. Talk Thanks to you a soon. Lot. Thanks for listening to this episode. I really appreciate you've taken the time. If you enjoyed it and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and a review. It really helps my message to get heard. If you have suggestions for future episodes or feedback on the podcast, don't hesitate to contact me by email at stefan.kybertz at gmail.com and I'll put my email address in the show notes. To catch all the latest from me, you can follow me on Twitter at Skybirds, that's S-K-Y-B-U-R-Z, and on LinkedIn. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.